I am going to tell you guys uh, my improbable story of how I started my business, how I got to be whatever I am today, um, and take from it what you will. I think um, it's funny. I've been listening to some of these speeches, and all y'all seem very digital. And I'm um, about as analog as that dude who just uh, who we just saw the video about, which was an incredible video. I very much related to it. Um, and it's just it's it's funny. I've done everything ass backwards in my life, um, and in hearing the speeches that preceded me, it seems like there are a lot of uh, there's a lot of talk about strategy, about how to uh, create the business or the communication, whatever it is you want to do in a strategic fashion. And I'm here to um, show you that uh, you don't need to, because <laughs> um, I've like fucked up everything on earth <laughs> over the years. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about how I got my start. Um, I always wanted to be a potter. I uh, fell in love with pottery as a kid, just knew that somehow it was my calling. Um, and I went to my pottery teacher at the end of college and said, hey, I want to be a potter. Um, like, do you think I have what it takes? And um, the, <laughs> she was like, no, <laughs> you suck, you have no talent, um, you should move to New York and just get a job. This was at RISD, and I, I hate to um, hate on her, and I'll just, I won't say who she is, I'll just say that her name begins with J and ends in Acklin Rice. <laughs> um, not saying, <laughs> heinous, heinous teacher. Um, but I you'll understand why I actually kind of love her. Um, so, per Jacqueline Rice, I um, skulked off, moved to New York, uh, got a proper job. It, after like six months of searching, I got a job um, working at a talent agency. Um, and luckily, I proved to be absolutely unemployable. I um, was on personal calls all the time. I, my boss would say like, you know, will you make this, you know, will you do such and such? And I'd be like, um, one minute, I'm just finishing up the call. Um, I was the office mattress. I literally was sleeping with everybody in the office. And I got fired, and um, my boss, who I was sleeping with, he fired me, but he was like, he was like, oh, I'll get you another job, because you don't want to, I don't want to be sued, so I'll get you a different job. So I was like, okay, whatever. So I got another job, and I got fired, um, and I got, fired from that, and I got another job, and I got fired. And so I was 26 and unemployed, um, and thought, you know, I miss pottery. I hadn't done it since school. So I uh, went and I got um, a job at this place called Mud, Sweat, and Tears. Not a job, but it was like I would teach classes at night in exchange for a little tiny bit of studio space. Um, and after six months of being unemployed, my parents were like, what's the plan? And I said, well, um, I want to be a potter. Now, this slide um, is pottery. I think it's what, what people think of when they think of pottery. And I, uh, it's kind of a cautionary tale of what pottery can be. Um, so, and I, I think, um, as, as I was trying to figure it out, I, um, I got an order from Barney's. I started to make pots. Um, and I knew I didn't want it to look like this. And <laughs> I knew that if it looked like that, I would look like this. <laughs> um, this was sort of, this was the image I had in my mind of potters, you know, people who, um, have never like trimmed or managed a single hair on their head or body. Um, and you know, I thought, oh God, I'm gonna be a potter and this is who I'll be, but fuck it, this is what I wanna do. Um, and I sort of resigned myself to a life with this as my future, because I thought, I wanna be a potter. My greatest hope could be that I could um, hawk my wares at a rain-soaked craft fair and uh, <laughs> and have a van and live like outside of Saratoga. And um, 
and I was cool with it because I was young and trying to figure out what I wanted to do and thought, I want to be a potter and I am going to accept the, the repercussions of that decision. Um, so this was going to be me. That's me in, in my studio now. Um, and th this is a picture of some of the first pots I made. These were like, I guess, 17 years ago when I started. Um, I decided that I wanted to make things that I wanted to make, that I, I wanted to put the whole idea of um, Jacqueline Rice out of my head and uh, follow my own heart and my own dream. Um, and so really, it was, it was about not making those, um, which is what, and not being him, <laughs> being me, and making these, um, which are pops that are uh, groovy and uh, graphic um, and spoke to my heart. Um, and I think that, let me see, what's my next slide? Oh, pillows, I'll get to that. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that I, I think that being sort of an outlier, having like sort of having this fuck it attitude, failing at jobs, finding myself completely unemployable, and following my passion um, in such an obscure, analog and uh, weird field like pottery um, led me to an attitude that was incredibly liberating, and I think anyone who has who is starting a job, starting a business, approaching any creative project should have, which is like, fuck it, there's nothing to lose, nothing to gain. You know, it's just, it, for me, it was a purely creative idea. I just thought, I'm gonna make the pots I wanna make, make the sacrifices that come with it, and follow my heart completely. Never think about what my teacher wanted me to do, never think about what was expected of me, and um, fuck it. So, I started making these pots, and, uh, my business slowly grew. I was like a one-man band as a production potter. And um, I actually, I shared studio space with uh, these other potters who were sort of like cautionary tales of what potters could be. They were like these people. They were not him. They were him. And um, they had been making the same stuff for like 20 years, uh, year after year. And I thought, oh, well, I need to be nimble. I need to change what I do and not just make the same stuff over and over again. So, um, I made other pots, stripey, <laughs> pots that had a, um, <laughs> pots that had like a cheeky message that were bold and memorable and unpottery-ish. And I wanted my work to be very diverse. Um, I wanted to not be like the potters with whom I shared a studio space who have been making the same stuff for, for many years. I wanted to be able to follow my heart, not be strategic, make whatever entered my head, and sort of just throw all preconceived ideas away. You know, typically in a pottery career or even in an artist's career, um, I think people think about like <laughs> brands, which is a word I hate, um, as trying to sort of, you know, make a statement and then keep refining it and developing it and nuancing it and blah, blah, blah. And I think in the, in the art and visual arts world, that typically uh, leads to someone having a very, very specific look that they tweak and develop. And I wanted um, my work to be whatever I wanted it to be, to not be uh, sort of hemmed in by brand ideas or strategy. Um, and just to make what I wanted to make. So, you know, one minute I could be making stripey pots, and the next minute I thought, you know what? I really want to do uh, some figural stuff that is um, kind of surreal and made in white porcelain and cheeky and provocative, and fuck it, I'll do it. Um, and then I thought, I want to make some pillows because why shouldn't I make pillows as well as pots? You know, I, I thought, yeah, I'll do whatever I want. I have nothing to gain, nothing to lose. Fuck it. Um, <laughs> so I started to make pillows. And I think I had, I had a little bit of a revelation that was uh, very liberating and clarifying to me. And this is going to 
I'm going to admit to being a little bit more strategic and brandy than I um, like to say I am, which is um, after being in business for about five or six years and making stuff, I, uh, I decided to have a proper think. Instead of just like doing it and following my heart, I thought, well, all right, this is becoming real. I'm sort of developing a cottage industry. What, am I, what is this? What could it be? And I had a revelation which was that my work was about creating design that was, I hope, incredibly chic and beautiful and craft-based. That's always been my true passion, um, is craft. And when I get up here, I'm sort of a little bit glib, but that's not the real me. Um, so I thought, I want to make work that's beautiful and designed and chic and well-crafted, but that has a spirit of optimism. Um, and irreverence. And I thought, you know, what it really is about is it's about irreverent luxury. It's about happy chic. And when I uh, sort of understood what the message of my work was, beyond just the visual uh, vocabulary of what I was doing, you know, I wasn't just making stripy pots or pots that had breasts on them or faces um, or pillows. I was sort of uh, communicating a spirit and an ethos. And I didn't have this revelation until maybe, I don't know, like seven or eight years into what I was doing. So the first seven or eight years were just like fuck it years. And then I got a little bit more varsity um, and, and figured out what I was trying to say with my work. And uh, anybody who is in a visual field, I really always encourage them to understand the, the underlying message of what they're trying to communicate. Because for me, it was incredibly liberating. Once I realized that my work was about irreverent luxury, or happy chic, or craft and, and, um, craft and joy, I could do a whole bunch of different stuff. That's one of my favorite pots. Um, and I knew I always wanted my stuff to be bold and memorable. <laughs> um, that's a giant brass banana, um, which I think actually perfectly exemplifies my irreverent luxury spirit. Um, that's probably about, I don't know, a couple feet big. It's like this. Um, and I'll just tell you guys a bit about how it's made, because it's, again, so analog. Um, in the studio, we make the model out of clay. And it kind of takes, it's sort of a feat of engineering in a really old school way to make this guy and make it castable. So I'm thinking about very, very, very practical, mechanical concerns in my day, which are probably, you know, you guys are probably all thinking about uh, digital concerns, and I'm thinking about super, like, practical, how's this thing going to be cast? Um, so we make the model, fire it, and then I have a workshop in Thailand that uh, casts brass for me. So it's all done in sort of the most, you know, ye olde way on earth, but, um, and it's very craft-based, and I love this pot. And then I thought, well, if I'm going to have this spirit of irreverent luxury, why make just pots and pillows? Why not make rooms? So I've become an interior decorator. Um, and again, it's all done in an ass-backwards, sort of intuitive, fuck it, kind of outlier way, um, with no real plan beyond following my passion and um, and staying true to my vision. More interior design. I love that. It's Year of the Dragon. Ooh, this is, a, uh, this is the one, one <laughs> commercial project that might be germane to all you guys, because it sort of was a Gesamtkunstwerk of um, brand and message. Um, this was this hotel I did in Palm Springs uh, called The Parker that um, sort of brought all of my interests and design work together. Um, and this is the restaurant in the hotel. It's called uh, Mr. Parker's. And for this project, I sort of uh, thought about somebody else's uh, message and brand and what it would be. And I invented this fictitious character called Mr. Parker, who was this sort of very loose, um, druggy dude. And this was his den. So this was a restaurant I did that I really liked. Um, and then this is one of my most recent pieces that I think really, uh, really shows what my work is about. 
Um, this is a gun hand. And um, I bring this up because I, when I first started, as I mentioned, I, I chose to not ever listen to anybody, to follow my heart, to not think about Jackie Rice. And I want to just um, end by talking a bit about focus groups and other people's opinions, which I absolutely loathe. Um, I hate other people's opinions, and I hate focus groups. And uh, my, my company now has gotten really unexpectedly big. It's all been accidental, but it's gotten big. We're opening our 18th store today. I have you know hundreds of employees, um, oy. And I have real varsity level concerns. And um, my challenge on a day-to-day -day basis is how to stay absolutely true to my spirit of fuck it, nothing to gain, nothing to lose, um, while managing a company and being responsible for a lot of people, which is a responsibility I take very, very seriously. Um, you know, because I employ a lot of people. Um, and so I think that when one's in a creative field, I think it's such an important balance to strike, to always remember to stay true to your creative goal, to your creative mission, in my case, irreverent luxury, cheeky stuff that was like a big fuck you to Jackie Rice, um, and um, while being a responsible, <laughs> a responsible person. And so I, um, as my company's grown, all like the people who are around me start to opine about the aesthetic of stuff. And I work really hard to be polite and ignore them. Um, and they always want me to work with focus groups. And I won't. And so sometimes I'll take an informal poll in my office. Um, and any time I make something like this or the brass banana, I really I ask everyone, you know, what do you think? And if um, if people seem either frightened by it or seem to hate it or have a visceral reaction against something, I'm like, great. So I, the only way in which I use a focus group is, is informally and as a completely, um, in a contrarian way. Uh, and I, I think that's such an important message uh, that you should just follow your gut, ignore Jackie Rice, um, have a fuck it attitude about everything and make whatever you want to make and it can lead to tremendous success and creative fulfillment.